Good morning, everybody. Paul here coming at you with a crypto coffee update where we talk about all the news events and happenings in the exciting space of digital finance and crypto. Now, there has been some construction going on recently uh, around my local area, so I apologize for any noise. I'm not going to tell you what recording attempt this is. Uh, so if there's any background noise or slight interruptions, my apologies, but we've got to make do with what we can. We cannot halt the consistent, ever-flowing uh, river of progress. And that definitely seems to be true for the crypto space as well. Before we get into that, though, join me for a simultaneous sip of hot, fresh coffee to get the episode started off right together in solidarity. Cheers. Ah, great stuff, folks. All right, so you can see here that Bitcoin has broken above the $4,000 mark, as per our friend Mitchell Moose over at Crypto Slate. Uh, and he's saying this data could potentially indicate a shift in sentiment, uh, maybe towards a more bullish market. Uh, he's done a great job aggregating all the information here about the most recent moves. Uh, but what interests me in particular is some of the developments we've seen uh, over a longer time horizon in the crypto space. We've seen permissioned ledgers like Corda's R3, or R3's Corda, excuse me, enterprise level. Uh, we've also seen IBM hyperledger uh, they've grown leaps and bounds on the permission side of things over in the more permissionless neighborhoods we have komodo which is doing some amazing stuff and of course now we have the uh, maker dao with the dai token which is a um, decentralized stable coin on the ethereum network they've had a little bit of issue pegging a one-to-one -one valuation with their token but nonetheless it is a herculean feat to do so in a distributed manner so cheers to them really interesting stuff happening in the space so this could potentially precipitate a move upward but what do you think do you think Think this is the beginning of great things to come in terms of price action in bitcoin i'll tell you one person who does origami oracle over in the cryptide discord that dude he is a heck of a technical analyst worth checking his stuff out so hop on over there if you haven't already and take a look at his stuff he definitely thinks this could be the beginnings uh, the humble beginnings perhaps of some amazing stuff coming out in the future so we'll leave that packed up for the time being we'll go ahead and get into some more articles and one thing that is a fundamental development here we go is new york stock exchange's parent company the intercontinental exchange or ice uh, they're talking about adding even more cryptocurrencies to their live data feed uh, they currently have about 60 of them you can see the list here i went ahead and pulled it up on their actual website uh, so we could look at the uh, meat of the matter straight from the horse's mouth, the primary source uh, over at theice.com. And here are all of the uh, coins that they are currently tracking. Some of them are particularly interesting. Uh, I was happy to see some great ones on here like Ardor. We have Cardano on here. Uh, of course, we have Bitcoin Cash, ABC, and SV, which are still... Um, denoted with the ABC and SV ticker. I found that particularly interesting since that's kind of shifted uh, in the past month, maybe two months, to just Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV. So that was pretty neat. Uh, also, they're tracking Cyber Miles, which I'm not too incredibly familiar with. So really kind of a um, hodgepodge list for the time beings, but definitely some major ones that you would assume the ICE, the ICE, ICE would want to be tracking. Uh, but nonetheless, they want to expand that to potentially thousands. So the idea of thousands of cryptocurrencies uh, being tracked is really interesting because a lot of these don't have a lot of liquidity. There's not a lot of market making going on. Um, and with such thin order books, one has to wonder, um, an accredited institutional level investor uh, using the New York Stock Exchange, uh, would they be in, even interested in trading some of these more illiquid small-time assets? Uh, really, who knows? They may be equi more equivalent or similar to penny, uh, penny stocks with a bit less liquidity, uh, but realistically, just the information uh, being presented to traders uh, is a benefit, at least in terms of moving the zeitgeist towards uh, more tokenized digital assets. So really interesting stuff there. Now, one article that I found just intriguing was by Greg Thomas, um, or Thompson, excuse me, Greg Thompson. Uh, he wrote this article, Sleeping with the Enemy, Why Institutional Adoption is Bad for Bitcoin. At first, uh, I kind of stuck up my nose at it, just admittedly, full disclosure. I thought, well, that doesn't make much sense. I know there's a lot of purists in this space that say, ah, oh, institutions, we don't need them. I want to stick with the libertarian mindset um, from 2013, 2014 Bitcoin culture before we had the hard fork and split from Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and all that. However, this is a fantastically articulated uh, argument about the Overton window um, and how it's beginning to shrink slowly but surely uh, through various levels of what could be called censorship or perhaps driving of a narrative about how this these kind of ecosystems uh, should function. Uh, he actually talks about the R Bitcoin subreddit, which has been plagued with a lot of censorship and deletion of comments uh, for various reasons, some justified, some not so much, but it definitely has had an empirical impact on how dialogue ultimately is undertaken. Uh, RBTC, which is the more Bitcoin Cash-oriented subreddit, 
uh, is sort of the a more neutral ground, although as said, they lean towards Bitcoin Cash. Uh, so it's really interesting to see this divisiveness in uh, what originally was a very open community predicated on dialogue. Uh, and Blockstream has a big part of this. We've discussed that previously, um, how they have basically been the de facto company uh, helping to guide the development of Bitcoin since 2016, as Greg says in the article. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's lost on me just due to the, my history in the space that a lot of folks, they don't already know this. Um, and this is because 2017 was the big run up, but this is really huge, a huge, huge um, touchstone in terms of cryptocurrency and really Bitcoin history. Uh, that Blockstream entered into the space. Um, Adam Back, the guy who created Hashcash back in the day, um, really became the guys who drive this entire thing forward. And that comes with all the potential biases associated with it. We're not going to go into this just for the sake of brevity, uh, but it definitely uh, el el elicits a sense of um, reflection in the idea that who is driving these innovations? Ultimately, what impact does that have on the applicability of the technology? Uh, and is that legitimate? Is that right? Should that should that ultimately be the way it is? Or should we as individuals who use this technology on, a, be, uh, on the day to day, should we shift over towards a different kind of more um, peer to peer governed model? Uh, really, there's a lot of implications. And that's not the only questions that could be asked. Um, but yeah, you might have heard the banging in the background there. So I got a wee bit distracted for uh, a second. But as said, we're not going to spend an incredible amount of time on this article. It's very much worth a read on your own time if you're looking for something uh, that leaves you with some rumination and no clearly outlined objective answers per se. So great stuff. Now some more uh, <laughs> some more information that may actually be um, of reprise to Greg and his um, seemingly lack of endearing feelings towards institutions uh, as they relate to cryptocurrency. The Chicago Board um, Options Exchange has delisted the Bitcoin futures contract that they offered. So the CBOE has said no more Bitcoin futures due to a lack of liquidity. Apparently, people just weren't trading it that much. And here's a quote from the CFE, the Chicago Futures Exchange. CFE is not adding a CBOE Bitcoin uh, XBT futures contract for trading in March. CFE is assessing its approach with respect to how it plans to continue to offer digital asset derivatives for trading. While it considers the, its next steps, CFE does not currently intend to list additional futures contracts for trading. Currently listed uh, futures contracts remain available for trading. So it seems as though they're not necessarily delisting all of them. Uh, they just aren't adding them back uh, and just leaving the bare bones minimum contracts that are the most used. Uh, so definitely interesting stuff there. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not uh, these futures contracts heavily impacted uh, the Bitcoin price and led to the bear market. And personally, I don't think that's necessarily the case. When you have a run up from $1,500 all the way to $20,000, a pullback is natural. Uh, but some are calling this capitulation in the idea that now institutional investors may be, uh, according to this data point, shying away uh, from futures contracts as they pertain to cryptocurrency. But again, we have a bit of conflicting information here as we see uh, the Chicago board delisting the futures contracts, but NYS see parent company talking about potentially listing more information about more cryptocurrencies. So a bit of conflicting sentiment, uh, no clearly delineated way one way or the other yet. Uh, but as said, this is where sometimes, uh, actually most of the time, we go further together than we do individually. Uh, and I rely actually on Origami Oracle, like I said, over in the Discord, uh, to kind of chart the course uh, for the shorter term. Since a lot of these articles we take a look at, a lot of this stuff uh, has broad sweeping implications. And, you know, HODL is kind of a meme here in the crypto world. Uh, you can buy certain projects that have fantastic fundamentals and hold them over the long term, as long as they are safe and secure. However, some of the more shorter term movements, uh, seeing being able to predict and have some kind of prescience, prescience as to how that's going to unfold, ultimately can leave you with a peace of mind uh, and not give you any heartburn as you're sitting here watching the charts wondering, what's going to happen next. Even if you do intend to hold for the long term, it's a temptation that I think all of us fall prey to in some way, shape or form, especially when you're invested. Self-interest after all. All right, so moving right along, uh, and this kind of goes back to the uh, positive um, check mark for institutional investment and interest in crypto. Um, a very large bank, Renta for Banco and BME, uh, they're carrying out the first test for digitization of certificate process of collateralized pledge using blockchain technology. So a very verbose way of saying they're essentially digitizing contracts uh, using a blockchain database management system. So that's fantastically interesting. It just goes to show that uh, more permissioned uh, styles of this kind of 
database structure are being deployed all around the world with a focus on interoperability. If we remember the uh, European Blockchain Observatory study that was done, uh, under, basically undertaken uh, by consensus on their behalf, it revealed that a lot of these permissioned uh, ledgers that focus on interoperability are going to be the first generation of mass adoption uh, just due to the fact that these database structures need to have their integrity uh, first and foremost uh, rather than focusing on the elements of distribution in the overall network topography. So that's very interesting stuff. Fantastic. Uh, one thing that causes issues with network topography is when you have a central point of access for your website, unfortunately. Um, and that's just kind of how it goes. ICANN is the um, con organization that controls uh, the domain name systems for web traffic. They're based out of California, interestingly enough. Uh, so if you didn't know that, some really cool stuff uh, that goes on. And a lot of times there are central bottlenecks of failure in our current web architecture. Um, and Steemit was unfortunately the victim of that recently as they experienced a DDoS attack. Uh, the blockchain itself remained fine, uh, wasn't that big of an issue for the blockchain, however, uh, the website itself, as said, did get uh, shut down for a short time. Seems that everything's up to date and good to go now, but it just goes to show that even if you have these kind of decentralized applications, um, and Steam it's a bit more centralized than not in its permissioned structure, um, you can still fall prey to the uh, vectors of vulnerability that are implicit in using uh, the current architecture of the World Wide Web that we all love to enjoy on a seemingly daily basis. Now, here's a quote from Adam Levine of Steemit, head of communications. We, uh, we've, Steemit.com, have been trying hard to improve our communications, which is why we've been putting out engineering updates every week. One challenge for us is that we have a lot of security concerns, and many Steemit employees are extremely security conscious, and for good reason. Their obsession with security is what helps keep our users and our app developers safe. And ultimately, it seems that everything, uh, all's well that ends well, pretty much. Everything is safe, and even though individuals were uh, denied access to the website for a short time, it seems everything is A-OK -okay for the time going forward. Now, we're going to take a look at an exciting project that I'm very uh, very happy with. I think they're doing really innovative and interesting stuff. Uh, I've been reading up on them. Jeez, um, it started last year when they first hosted their ICO. Uh, I kind of watched from the distance to see how things unfolded. And they were very successful in building this new ERC-1155. It's a crypto item standard. We've talked about this previously on the channel. Uh, but given the exciting price action and the attention that the team has been getting due to the announcement that Engine will be supported by the Samsung uh, Galaxy S10, blockchain wallet on the new mobile device. Uh, really interesting stuff happening for the project. So I wanted to go ahead and dive a bit deeper uh, and share with you guys some resources that you can use to better inform yourself as to why this is so exciting. Uh, I find it fascinating and riveting. Uh, the ERC-1155 contract code essentially allows you uh, to execute multiple transactions relative to uh, a single item, rather than having to submit a new transaction to augment that item state um, and submit gas costs, essentially. Uh, that's really, really rudimentary uh, in terms of explanation. Uh, perhaps you could see how it could ultimately save you money and time with not having to submit a new contract every time. Uh, but the finer details that are in this article really, really add a level of nuance that will help to explain how this is revolutionary, especially for more gamified applications like CryptoKitties, for example, or for any blockchain game that would want to attest a state to the blockchain. Uh, think about it like this. If I move my chess piece I have to send a new transaction to the Ethereum network to let everybody in the network know I just moved my uh, bishop to e6. So that's a very cumbersome and costly process. Having a type of contract code where you can make your move and at the end of the game, attest all of that information to the Ethereum blockchain it really would save a lot of time and a lot of energy. Uh, so definitely, if you're interested in that sort of thing, if you're interested in how slowly but surely Ethereum is becoming optimized in a very distributed form through a multiplicity of various self-interested teams, this is a great article to dive into. Uh, this was also partially inspired by the fact that Engine released Engine X, which is a blockchain browser, to help to drive mass adoption. So they're not just focusing on the technical side of things with Im uh, implementing a new contract code that's helping to revolutionize transactions on the Ethereum network, but they're also helping you see that exact process. This article goes into details about the Explorer, but words are fun, but examples are more enjoyable. Here we are at enginex.com, or .io, excuse me, enginex.io, and I'm going to show you the homepage here. Boom, there we go. Simple as that. You just have a nice X and just one box. And you can even just click blockchain search and it'll take you to a more detailed, um, uh, not analysis, a detailed breakdown of the ledger and what's happening. You can see here all these transactions that were submitted. Let's click blocks over on the left hand side. 
boom, you can see all of these various blocks on the Ethereum network. You can see who mined them. Oh, look at that. 28 seconds ago, we just had an Ethereum block mined. F2 pool. Oh, another one. So really fascinating stuff. I think this, uh, this level of transparency is just amazing and fantastic and thank you to the engine team and congratulations for all the hard work you've been putting in and the recognition you're getting for it definitely well deserved uh, and this tool i just find particularly fancy i'll put it below in the uh, in the description like i said just fun to toy around with um let's take a look at binance coin Boom, there you go. It tells you smart contract address, token rank, total supply, circulating supply, and a small description. So really, this is the kind of thing that can uh, really help an individual who wants to learn more about these projects that are on the Ethereum network. And speaking of the Ethereum network, the co-founder of Consensus, Joseph Lubin, and the co-founder of Ethereum itself, has said that most of the economy will be blockchain in 10 to 20 years, which I could reasonably see. Now, people may think that, oh, this means Bitcoin and other distributed systems, but a lot of the times, the more permission systems ultimately will kind of eat the distributed systems lunch in the early half, and who knows, they may have us in the first half, I gotta admit, but who knows what's gonna happen later on. Uh, more distributed systems may ultimately become a subjective preference of uh, individuals in the future. Uh, but here's a quote from Joseph Lubin. In Bitcoin and currently in Ethereum, you need to have specialized hardware, burn lots of electricity, waste lots of computation, basically to keep everybody in sync. With ETH 2.0 in 18 months, we'll have a blockchain system much more powerful and scalable that uses orders of magnitude less energy. Personally, just because of the Lightning Network, I, I have like PTSD um, with the term 18 months. De definitely uh, don't like those, those numerical predictions like that. Lightning Network has been 18 months away for four years now. Um, I just like picking fun at them because that was a very hard line stance that they took at the uh, outset. Uh, but Ethereum scalability has definitely been uh, something that's been worked on in a much more serious manner from the outset. Uh, not that Lightning Network hasn't had some of the best minds to, uh, chipping away at the solution, but uh, yeah, let, let's just say uh, fingers crossed for 18 months, hopefully sooner, and hopefully things can go off without a hitch. All right. Now, court has compared Bitcoin to cryptocurrency when dismissing a lawsuit. We talk about precedents here on this channel um, and how uh, legal precedents ultimately can set the stage uh, and maybe even offer some hints as to how the judicial side of things are shaping up uh, and how the U.S. courts are beginning to view uh, these kind of um, cases, essentially. And the reason we focus on the U.S. courts particularly uh, is because, as you may remember, we talked previously in, I think, two episodes ago, uh, we looked at ICO Bench, I think it was ICO Bench, and we got to see that disproportionately the United States is home both in capital uh, raised and in a total number of ICOs. Uh, they are the lion's share of the market in terms of jurisdiction, so fantastically interesting uh, given the fact that they are one of the most complicated jurisdictions uh, in which to have such a project. Again, we saw Gladius token have to give back all of their ICO funds and start over uh, after accidentally winding up as a security. So rough stuff. Howie test. Check it out if you want to launch a project. Super important. So the court dismissed a lawsuit because it was filed directly against an individual on a corporate veil piece, uh, piercing theory, but didn't plead any of the necessary elements to justify the move. Uh, basically, this goes all the way back to 2013. And this individual said, hey, uh, this person uh, apparently uh, basically stole my cryptocurrency um, because I had whatever happened, basically. Uh, this is back in 2013. There's a five-year window, um, no, excuse me, it's a three-year window uh, in which you can file this kind of uh, suit. Ultimately, it's been, what, like six, seven years now? So it was thrown out on that precedent. He can amend it if he wants to. Uh, but it's interesting because according to the court, currency of any type fluctuates in value, and anticipating a given currency's future value involves some level of speculation. But that alone does not mean that no harm occurred at the date of taking in 2013. Any manifest and palpable injury commences the statutory period under California law. So again, he missed the statutory period, but this part right here, currency of any type fluctuates in value. Uh, there's an impulse Implicit assumption here that Bitcoin is now at least like a currency in the eyes of the law, which is very uh, interesting. Keep in mind, California was home to another lawsuit uh, last year in 2018 in which an individual was ruled to uh, essentially pay bail in Bitcoin. Uh, really, it was just taken as collateral. Um, but again, potentially that precedent could impact how the court viewed uh, the um, asset in question in this instance. Uh, so seeing this kind of thing shape up is really interesting. Uh, speaking of cash and um, 
raising money. This is what Tendermint did recently. They secured $9 million um, in a Series A financing round led by the company Paradigm. So Tendermint is a consensus algorithm. Uh, it is open source. You can just plug and play essentially. Uh, and it's really interesting. I've been learning more and more about consensus algorithms and the <laughs> plethora of them that are available currently. Uh, and Tendermint is definitely one of the most popular out there at present. So good to see that they're raising capital. Uh, to continue to work hard, continue to improve the algorithm. Um, so yeah, great stuff there. Now, one thing that I try to drive home is do your own research, which is very important. That's what I try to help everyone with here. Uh, but also, do your own research before you make any moves, and always try and plan your action steps in advance, and have contingency plans. One thing that can help you plan your action steps uh, is to truly consider whether or not, one, if a blockchain uh, is right for your business, if it could benefit you directly, empirically, in any justifiable time frame. Uh, there's no sense in building a Rube Goldberg machine. But also, if you decide that that is the case, what type of blockchain do you want to implement? Should you go with something that's proprietary? Should you build on a permissioned ledger? Or should you opt for one of the most permissionless distributed structures possible? There's no clear objective answer, and there's a plethora of pros and cons associated therein with all of those questions. So what I'd like to do is take this uh, final article here and just talk about uh, some of the misconceptions and benefits of security tokens. Uh, this is written by, we're going to scroll to the bottom and give a shout out here because I know his name is on there. Mm -mm -mm. Mark Boyron. It is a fantastic article. I want to thank Mark personally uh, for authoring this since I think it is a fantastic tool that I can in turn leverage to help you all, uh, my lovely audience, which I who I very much appreciate and want to offer the best information to keep you safe. So, misconceptions. Security tokens give it access to a global pool of capital. Security tokens are not what makes it possible or even more efficient to raise capital globally. And this is what we're going to do. We're just going to go um, with a few of these points and look at the summations and you can go in and read the details yourself, uh, some of which might be surprising. Security tokens are not what makes it possible or even more efficient to raise capital from US non-accredited investors. So some individuals have the misconception that uh, the voracious uh, money we've seen flowing through the space in 2017 uh, is uh, it's predictive of the liquidity that will ultimately be available and the ability to capital raise um, that we saw then. That's what security tokens will offer. Not necessarily the case. Security tokens are not what makes it possible to trade private securities 24-7. You could already do so. Uh, this individual uses the example of meeting up for coffee and swapping securities. Super simple. While this may ultimately make it easier in the long run, it doesn't at present. Security tokens are not currently resulting in reduced issuance cost. You still have to pay the cost of issuing your security. It's ultimately not going to have uh, an immediate empirical effect on diminishing the upfront cost. Next, security tokens are not what creates liquidity for private securities. Can't stress that enough. Uh, just because you're tokenizing your asset, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have in, uh, liquidity um, just intrinsically present in that marketplace. Uh, so it definitely doesn't help at present with that issue. And security tokens are not what enables fractional reserve ownership of real world assets. You could totally already do that. Anybody who's created an LLC can tell you, hey, I have fractional ownership of this if I'm in it with a partner. Um, and you can even issue uh, just percentages, any percentage you want. Uh, so d interesting stuff. There are some real benefits, though. Uh, security tokens will enable greater liquidity than traditional securities um, in due time. Again, a lot of this stuff is still building up slowly but surely. Uh, technology takes time to reach maturation. Think of Amazon. They were a bookseller for decades. Security tokens will enable the more efficient and cost-effective transfers of fractional interests in real-world assets. That's definitely true. You may have a fractional ownership of a particular asset, uh, and you want to transfer that. Well, you have to have the um, essentially the acquiescence of all of the other individuals um, who own parts of that asset, uh, at least in many cases. Uh, so this could make that extremely easy, especially with the implementation of smart contracts and that sort of uh, technological um, tools. Security tokens will ensure greater compliance with laws. Uh, definitely have not seen that so far in the ICO markets as you could uh, probably assume. However, security tokens will allow a more flexible um, interaction with a legal framework since after all, a lot of the times at present, these laws are so opaque and diverse, jurisdictionally specific, especially because we're in a federated system. Uh, so ultimately, having a more flexible digital form of compliance with securities law will allow a flourishing of human economy in the United States. Amazing stuff. And they'll enable more efficient cross-border trading. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? It's electronic. Uh, security tokens will enable, enable better cap table management. Um, if you are in this space and you are looking at starting a project and you have not heard of cap table management, um, I, I 
implore you to do a quick Google search on that. Uh, learn about cap table management. It'll save you a lot of headache in the future. Trust me. Security tokens will facilitate better corporate governance. They definitely will. Imagine the, the ease of governance that can be achieved without having to have a 2 a.m. phone call. Uh, rather, you can, you can even implement a uh, decentralized autonomous organization if you so choose. So definitely security tokens can allow um, better governance on, from a corporate structure. And they'll enable more efficient and, uh, and transparent payment for distributions, of course, makes sense, uh, as is native with blockchain. And they will make it easier to include utility in securities. Thank goodness a lot of the utilities tokens that were uh, alleged utility tokens uh, in the great 2017 run-up didn't ultimately have that much utility. Uh, so fantastic article again by, let me grab his name one more time, Mark, Mark Boyron. Uh, thanks again for writing this fantastic article. I hope you all found it helpful. Uh, you can glean some insights uh, and some ruminations uh, for you to consider as to whether or not a blockchain may even be applicable or if a security token in particular is how you want to go about uh, issuing uh, equity for your company. So great stuff there. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'm glad the uh, construction <laughs> didn't get too crazy. Uh, definitely sounded like destruction, hammering and whatnot. Let me know if that was too bad. I'm, I'm curious what you guys thought. And also let me know what you think about this article in particular. Is institutional adoption great for Bitcoin? Is it horrible for Bitcoin? I found this one really great. And where do we think, where, where are we going, folks? Where do you think we're going? Are we going to the moon? Are we going to have a uh, kind of tepid compression of price here? I don't know. Let's ask Origami Oracle over at the Crypti Discord. I will see you guys there. But for now, my name is Paul. Thanks so much for watching. We are Cryptide, and remember, the tide is rising, as is industrial progress around my area. Nice.